Welcome to Buffalo Camp Day Recap. I'm Thad Brown, he's Carl Jones. Day six of camp complete. We're now over halfway through training camp, which is crazy to see one week into training camp, but it is you know that short in terms of number of sessions and number of time. Uh, one note for today's practice, Sean McDermott, the Bills head coach, was not at practice today. According to the team, he had a personal family matter to attend to. Uh, we are recording this uh, a little bit after lunchtime on Tuesday. He might already be back on campus from what the team said, um, but regardless, he should be back uh, with the team very, very soon and, and should not be an issue uh, long term. As for today's practice, Number one reaction was it didn't seem like the offense did very well. And we'll get into that in a minute. But all of this has to be couched in the idea that it also seemed like this was the day where the defense got to pin their ears back, attack, blitz, and it seemed like the offense's job today was being able to handle that. So there were a lot of, you know, dump outs, flares, you know, kind of escape throws, hot throws, that kind of thing. So, you know, although it looked like the offense had a rough day, it might have been a scripted hot, hot uh, tough day today. 100%. There was, I believe, the second team period. Blitz after blitz, blitzing from corners, blitzing from double A gaps. I saw a, double, a lot of mug looks from the linebackers up top. So it looked like, like you just alluded to, both sides of the ball knew what type of day it was going in. Just the offense wasn't able to react. Now, to be fair, though, without the pass, you don't do a lot of blitzing in general. So this is probably the offense's first taste of all that heavy doses of pressure. And it affected them. I mean, a lot of pre-snap penalties, which are probably getting out a little bit earlier because mm -hmm. there's a guy blitzing, the receiver. It just wasn't a clean day for the offense. A lot of mental miscues, and the defense took advantage of that. So I got to give them their flowers for a very, very dominant day from my perspective. Yeah, and let's not sit here and excuse everything the offense did. Like you said, the pre-snap penalties, you know, no one will uh, allow in any situation. And, you know, you can tell Josh Allen, very beginning of the second team session, uh, was visibly frustrated at one point because the pressure was getting to him. Um, you know, I think a lot of credit across the defensive line. I saw Ed Oliver in the backfield. Leonard Floyd had a decent day. Um, Daquan Jones doing good things. Greg Rousseau some push. So, you know, it really didn't matter. And, and again, that might have to do with the fact that everybody was blitzing. Um, but it was overall a very, you know, attack-oriented day for the defense and, and uh, offense disappointed. Now, even though uh, that was the case, you know, they did a rebound later on. We're going to get to Gabe Davis's day in a little while. Um, I thought the response was fine. You know, there was some success, um, but you know that this was not after three really good offensive days. This was probably a little bit of a step back offensively. Yeah, but like you just alluded to, though, a rough first team period. I mean, really, really bad. I mean, what, three pre-snap penalties. Josh got stepped on. He's fine, folks. Don't worry about that. But it was a scare at first. I don't want to say they were exceptional the rest of the practice. However, I thought they rebounded enough to make it sufficient enough to where they can go back into that locker room, watch the film later on, and be pleased with how they rebounded. But yeah, it wasn't encouraging to see, especially with the offensive line. You know, you're trying to get the cohesive unit on that perspective. A lot of pressure allowed up front. But once again, like I always like to say, the defense gets paid too. And it was a different juice with them. I know they were running back onto the field for the third team session. And they just look like a bunch of hyenas just ready to hunt. They just looked really, really locked in and dialed in. So kudos to the defensive coaching staff for getting those guys ready for a day that was meant to be in their favor. You know, the attack day is for the defense to go out there and hunt. So I got to give them, once again, their kudos and their flowers for stepping up to the task at hand. The hyenas will be excited to hunt when they've been eating all day. That was kind of the case in this practice. Let's update where we are with the rotations of the three important job battles, corner two, offensive guard, middle linebacker. Um, I think the big note was that middle linebacker where Terrell Dotson was back in at the number one spot. The first three days, it was Dotson, then Terrell Bernard, then Balen Specter. <clears throat> it's possible to conclude that Specter might be at least out of the mix for now. So it's a two-man race, we, you know, we're practice six, who knows, between Terrell Bernard and Terrell Dotson. Um, at guard, Osiris Torrance continues to get heavy reps on the first team, second day in a row at least, where I thought he had significantly more um, than Ryan Bates. And yesterday, you know, some of those guard reps were because Bates was playing center for Mitch Morse. Bates didn't do a whole lot of that today. Morse was pretty much the number one center um, all the way through. At corner, Dane Jackson still started the day, but Kyer Elam got significant first team reps. And I think, you know, I don't know how much, if you want to say that that job is a close race right now, I think. Dane Jackson is still significantly ahead, but last two days it feels like Elam is closing some space there a little bit. Yeah, he's creeping up a little bit. I think that's the word I would use. Once again, the first period, I believe, is a walkthrough team period or whatever. Dane was the first one out there. However, the next two team periods, Kyrie was the first corner opposite Trey White out there, which leads me to believe 
they're getting a little bit more comfortable with him or just seeing what he has. I mean, obviously, we haven't even got to the first scrimmage yet, so there's a long way to go to improve this battle. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, we're still more than a month out from the first game. Yep, yeah, so September there's, 11. Yeah. There's a lot of reps, a lot of chances for that, for that unit in particular, that battle to play itself out. Benford didn't get see as many first-team snaps today, but I'm not going to put too much stock into that considering it wasn't a day for the receivers and DBs to really go at each other considering that it was a day of blitz pickup and, and heavy pressure. So this day, I won't put too much stock into it, but it was – I did take note of the reps from that position in particular. And to your point, though, I didn't feel like Dane or Benford or Kyer Elam had a particularly good or bad day. It Just because like, the reps didn't lead itself to exactly, be Exactly. Like yeah. It was kind of a no-blood day because it wasn't their focus in terms of deep down the secondary. Press conference-wise, um, we talked to Damian Harris, Deion Dawkins, and secondary coach John Butler. Deion Dawkins, as you might expect, the headliner, he was fantastic. A um, couple things that I thought were interesting. Number one, he talked about Josh Allen maturing as a leader and, and how much you know he's getting better there. Not that he wasn't mature as bef before, but one thing that Deion pointed out was is that you know Josh Allen doesn't have kids, uh, doesn't have a family with kids right now, but Deion said he feels like he does have it feels like Josh does have a family and I'm pretty sure he was referring to the team as a whole that he's kind of the not the father but certainly the one one of the leaders of that family and it was you know fascinating to see how much respect Dion has for Josh Allen we've known that for a long time but to look at it in this way and Dion always has a unique perspective um, I thought was fascinating talked a little bit to him about how Josh and Mitch Morse are in their fifth year together, quarterback-center combo. Um, in terms of those two guys, usually your quarterback and your center, are the center, the heartbeat of calling out protections when it comes to getting ready for a, a pass play. And you know what Dion said was, it's like a driving test. They've taken a thousand times. They know all the answers. They know where to go. They know what each other's going to say. And it obviously makes a, a big, big difference. John Butler, the defensive backs coach, talked earlier in the day and had some interesting thoughts about certainly Kyer Elam, um, the CB2 competition, and what's going on in the defensive backfield. Yeah, two points that I really, that caught my eye from the first, um, that conversation before practice today. One, he didn't shut down the idea of a platoon system into week one. Obviously, he said they'd done it in the past, going, dating back to Levi Wallace and even last year in the Rams game where Benford saw significant snaps as well as Kyer and Dane. Having said that, I don't know if any coach would want that to be the ideal scenario. However, if no guy separates himself, that just may be the scenario for the first quarter of the season, so to speak. And But outside of that, he talked about the different skill sets they have. And from the outside perspective, it kind of crystallizes what we felt. You know, we all know that Kyer Elam was this freak athlete drafted to play well at the line of scrimmage. And Butler said that. He was like, yeah, he's really good at the line of scrimmage. We need to continue to hone in on his skills away from the line of scrimmage. He said, Dane Jackson gives you a little bit of both of both the best worlds up there, backpedaling and stuff in that nature, but he's experienced. He has the most experience of those three guys. And then also when he talked about Benford, he said that at this point, the Villanova thing is out the picture. Like being a small school guy, he said right now he's a really aggressive, heady guy. He, he don't want to call him a veteran, but he was a very smart player. I think this, this word that he describes, and he's also once again can play up at the line of scrimmage and off as well. He said three different players, three different unique skill sets. So what skill set is going to be the one that rises to the top and that they want opposite to Trey White, that remains to be seen. But the fact that he described those guys differently, he didn't want to compare them. He made that clear. But I thought that was unique. And he talked a little later about, you know, how much intelligence goes into playing defensive back these days, you know, here in Buffalo and just in general because of what offenses are able to do creatively. And, you know, in Buffalo, we, we've talked and heard about how this scheme, you know, is a little better fit for Christian Benford because he played it before, not so much for Kyrie Elam. And I think it maybe crystallizes a little better the learning curve and the amount that a guy like Kyer Elam needs to adjust and educate himself on before he can be totally comfortable and successful in the system, which might you know explain, and we talked about this a million times, why he struggled so much last year. Just think about it from this perspective. Someone like Kyer who comes from a, a man system in college, I literally only have to worry about one guy every single snap. It's a totally different learning curve when you play a zone system where I have to focus on the other 10 guys on the field as well. And that is so hard to train your mind from going off from just one guy the entire play as opposed to the other, the other 10 on the field. And Bifford has done that for four years in college. So that is a steep learning curve that seems simple, like, hey, just play zone, right? But when you've trained your mind to be one way for such a long time, it is hard to flip the switch. So of course, it 
makes sense why Benford is so comfortable in a system that he's done for a long time. One more thing with Deion Dawkins, by the way. He was asked about uh, seeing Kim Pagula, who was at practice on Sunday, and Deion said it was beautiful. This is a quote. It was beautiful. It was like an answered prayer. You know, clearly um, something that impacted the team, and especially for someone like Deion, who's been in this organization for so long, going into his seventh season, it blew him away to think about he's been here that long. To be able to see Kim Pagula improving and getting better, you know, it, it's uh, there's a connection between the ownership and the long-term core guys that makes it important for something like that to happen and for these guys to be able to see it happen, you know, a little bit, at least for one day, right in front of their eyes. All right, time to hand out some turkey burgers, and this was a, a big turkey burger day. There were some guys, we had turkey burgers ourselves today, by the way, about time. Uh, they were fantastic. There were two or three guys today that really had standout performances. Um, I'm going to go first with a guy who's maybe a little lesser on the list, but one that will be of more interest to local fans. Kingsley Jonathan, the uh, Syracuse grad. Um, specifically, the offensive line, defensive line has a drill where they go two-on-two -two rushing. No, nothing else going on, no quarterbacks, receivers, just pass rush, pass blocking. And he had three reps, including one um, against Ryan Bates and Spencer Brown, where I thought not only did he win, but he won, you know, fairly impressively. And this is a guy that was on, you know, the, a closer to the roster border than you would have thought of last year on a team where they've got so many high asset edge rushers already on the team. Um, you know, I really haven't noticed him much before today, but today I thought he had a pretty, pretty solid day, especially that one drill. Love to see that, especially when you are fighting for a spot and who knows what happens above him on the depth chart with all the guys they have above him. Having said that, you can only control what you can control. So the fact that he can do that is impressive. And Boogie Basham and Greg Rousseau both had extensive reps at defensive tackle today. It doesn't mean that that's going to open a spot for another edge, but you know they are moving those guys around quite a bit. Control what you can control at yeah. this point. I know we talked about the offense not having its best day, but I got to give my turkey burger to Gabe Davis. The first session wasn't great for the team. However, the second team period, he caught, I believe, two out of the first three passes from Josh Allen, about 10, 15 yards down the field. and it, flipped the switch a little bit for the offense and it helped them get back on track. Obviously, they didn't have an A day, but they could have easily cratered if Gabe didn't have two nice catches down the field. And the play of the day, I believe the only explosive play from the offense today was a beautiful hole shot about 20, 30 yards down the field between uh, Trey White and Taron Johnson. Gabe Davis corrals it in, gave the offense a lot more juice than they would had it to that point. So I got to give my turkey burger to Mr. Gabe Davis. Super hands catch that was too. I mean, one of those elite, you know, reach out and, you know, catch kind of the back half of the ball. It was a high, high level play for Gabe. Uh, my second turkey burger, Matt Milano. And, you know, he's a great blitzer. I'm sure if I went back through the film of practice, we'd see him blowing in. Uh, I wasn't really watching the linebackers more, watching D-line, O-line today. But he had one play where he was uh, required to cover Dalton Kincaid down the sideline on a fade and just stuck on him like glue. Josh Allen still tried to throw the pass, um, you know, give Kincaid a chance to go up and get it. Milano won him the whole way, um, got the hand up at the end, never had to turn around. Timing was good, technique was good. It just showed, I mean, this is a guy who was a first team all pro last year. That was a first team all pro play. Granted, Kincaid hasn't done a single thing in the NFL yet, but everything we've seen so far, and he's a first round pick, indicates this is probably a high level talent, and Milano basically erased him on the play. The fact that a linebacker can do that is very impressive. Yeah. Linebackers aren't supposed to be able to be that composed down the field. They're supposed to panic or draw penalties in that regard. So that was encouraging. It was right in front of us, so it was, it was so beautiful to see that. For mine, staying on the defensive side of the ball, Cam Lewis had a day. Third team session, Latavius Murray, big boy, right? Oh, biggest guy, biggest running back in the team by a lot. Cam Lewis didn't care. Now, they're not hitting, they're not tackling, but it was a nice little thud that, you know. There's a little more than thud. Little, you, he, he probably went across the line of that head. No one minded, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Latavius ended up on the ground, that's all I'm going to say. Yep, yep. And, and, it was, and that was good to see. Got the uh, defense a little juice right in front of the defensive sideline. And then later on in practice, Khalil Shakir, right down the seam, Josh Allen tried to get him on the deep ball. Cam Lewis came in and broke it up at the last second. He had a couple other plays and one-on-ones where he got a PBU. A guy who's a backup nickel, a backup safety, doing whatever it takes to make sure that he makes this roster. Because there's a lot of depth guys on this team who can, you know, be swing guys. So the fact that he's able to cross train at nickel, at safety, and then also lay the lumber in the run game was good to see. Cam Lewis, shout out to you, my man. No guarantee that Cam Lewis makes his team. He is. If there's anyone who's on the bubble, it is Cam Lewis to be one of the last 53 when we go into week one.
All right, that'll do it for today's edition of Buffalo Camp Day Recap. Want to point out to Damian Harris did meet the media. We've got a, a feature story with him. I sat down and talked with him a few days ago. Fantastic guy. I mean, just the type of person that when you talk to him, you feel better about yourself and life afterward. And look, it's not an accident. This is the way that Damian Harris lives his life. Um, he grew up with a single mom who did everything for him, was a heck of an inspiration. Now he wants to be an inspiration for everyone else. So please go to Rochester first, find that story. You will be thankful you did. It's a great Great guy to talk to and uh, hopefully a great encapsulation of who he is. We'll be more, uh, we'll have more from Buffalo Bills training camp on Thursday. Next practice session will be then. We'll have another edition of Buffalo Camp Day recap as always right here at rochesterfirst.com and on Spotify in podcast form. For Carl Jones, I'm Thad Brown. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll see you again on Thursday.